from Microbe TV. This is Immune, episode number 17, recorded on February 12th, 2019. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast about the body's defenders against disease. Joining me today from Ithaca, New York, Cindy Leifer. Hi, welcome back, listeners. Did you get any skiing in yet? We did. I've been <laughs> skiing almost every weekend. Yay. Nice. Where do you go to Greek Peak? <laughs> we do, yeah. The kids are getting um, much better. Cool. Yeah, they're, they, have, they have black diamonds with jumps and grinds and things, and I'm watching my children go off and fly 10 feet in the air. It's a little freaky, but they're having a great time. Also joining us from the ski capital of the world, Durham, North Carolina, Steph Langle. <laughs> hey there. Yes, skiing may be water skiing if it was warm enough, but I'm definitely, I, we were talking earlier before the podcast started, I've become the person that nobody really wants to hear the weather from. <laughs> I think last week it got up to like 75. So right now it's a little cold. It's a little cold but and rainy, but it's not too bad. Today is Darwin Day. Yay. I didn't know on, that until you He was said. born on February 12th, which is today, 1809. Wow. And the day is used to highlight his contributions to science and to promote science in general. You can go to darwinday.org uh, to find out more about that. So happy Darwin Day, everybody. Excellent. Happy <laughs> Darwin, Darwin Day. Day. That's right. In fact, if you go to, uh, <laughs> he is uh, 200 some years old. Today. 210, right? 210, right. Because it's 2019. Wow. Yes. Yep. He just keeps getting older and older. <laughs> as we all. Yes, as we all. Well, in this uh, rotation that is immune, it's Cindy's turn. It is. <laughs> what have you got for us today? Well, surprise, surprise, we're going to talk about macrophages. <laughs> Yay, your favorite. Your favorite. <laughs> yeah, we, we went back and forth. I there I, I was I was telling Steph that I, I went looking for papers, and there were just way, way too many cool things that have come out lately. Yeah. And I sent her a bunch, and she's like, we have to do all of these. <laughs> of course. And I was like, well, which one are we going to do? <laughs> so I, I picked one called Metabolic rewiring of macrophages by CPG potentiates clearance of cancer cells and overcomes tumor expressed CD47 mediated don't eat me signal. So I, so giggle, right? So right. hopefully everybody's giggling a little bit. I always get snickers when I talk about eat me signals and don't eat me signals and find me signals in, in my immunology classes because you know they're college students so like hee hee. <laughs> right. So, but yeah, so this is a don't eat me signal. So I, I think this paper was really cool because one, it's macrophages, which I love. Um, two, it's CPG DNA, which is uh, something near and dear to my heart that I've been working on for a long time. And I like the idea of macrophages being able to kill cancer cells. And so how cancer cells overcome those um, mechanisms for macrophages to eat, kill and eat them. What, what exactly those are and how can we use those to better understand um, how cancers are evading, you know, immune responses and, and how we can might overcome those um, ourselves with therapy to try and treat cancer. So I thought this was rather interesting. So it was published um, just this year in Nature Immunology. And um, the authors are, now you, you're better at this than I am, Vincent, so Mingan Liu Min Jen mm -hmm. Liu, Roddy O'Connor, I can say that one, Sophie Treffoli, uh, Kathleen Graham, Nathaniel Snyder, and Gregory Beatty. Beatty? Beatty? Um, and so they're from UPenn and Drexel. And I, I, I also like this paper a lot because it talks about um, biochemistry. That just yeah. scares me. So I'm going to tell you that right off the bat. So I very am likely to say many things wrong this episode because biochem is, I took it and I, it's been a long time since I took biochemistry. The, the biochemists can email us with their, you know, praise or or folly. So, and I, yeah, you get automatically get uh, a plus for e attempting the biochemistry. But <laughs> I, when I, when, you, <laughs> when you're asking me which paper to do, I felt somebody had commented that they really enjoyed when we talk kind of like talked about our own research within the context of the paper kind of helps put it together. And I thought, well, since you really like macrophages, and this is, you know, an aspect of your lab. Um, and plus the don't eat me signals. It's a it's a good arc talking about um, cancer cells in the past and inhibitory markers. So I think, yeah, it's a good fit. 
Yeah, and the, and I will I will give it my biochemistry attempt. I don't know if I deserve an A plus. You can wait until the end to see. But uh, definitely one of the things that um, has been hot now um, for a couple of years is looking at how cells metabolize glucose and how that influences their function in immune responses. And it started really looking at T cells, but has become a major player in understanding macrophage function as well. And I guess it's very fitting because Friday we went and did one of these assays for the very first time on, in some of our experiments. So I, I kind of sort of understand the assay that they did oh, nice. in part of this. So I'll try and explain it as best I understand it. So, um, so just to start off, why are they interested in any of this? Well, so cancer is clearly a big problem. I don't think we need to go that far back. <laughs> but macrophages are able to kill cancer cells. So they have this capacity. But there are a number of things that tumor cells do to thwart those immune responses. And so we have uh, tumor-associated macrophages that have this potential to kill the tumor cells, but they're suppressed somehow by their microenvironment. And really, that's one of the things that I'm, I'm really interested in my lab right now, too. What are those microenvironmental cues? So this was also very interesting to me that way. And so, um, so they're capable of this, but they don't do it. Um, and the other thing they can do is they can be reprogrammed. So macrophages are really adaptive cells depending on cues they get. And so tumor cells can secrete and make cues and modify the microenvironment to actually, uh, I guess, sort of like um, put macrophages in a trance, right? right. And to, to bring them over to the dark side and have them promote, <laughs> promote the cancer growth. So not only are macrophages capable of killing the tumor cells and they don't do it, but then the tumor cells make the macrophages promote their own growth. Right. So, so the cancer cells are taking advantage of this massive plasticity that the macrophages have, which is amazing. I mean, I think, you know, when we in the past have learned about macrophages, it's it's like, well, they go to the tissue and that's what they do and they phagocytize and they, you know, they clean up the dead cells, but yep. they really differentiate depending on what tissue. Exactly. Yeah. And they're really abundant. So, so they're an, um, they're a a really great potential target. So if we could redirect them away from the 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 in signals that they're getting from the cancer cells and turn them back against the cancer, there really is a capacity to try and eliminate a significant uh, tumor burden in in an individual. How how does a, a macrophage promote tumor growth? It is it by the production of, of cytokines, say that that stimulate growth. Yep. So one of the things that they can secrete is tumor growth factor. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, and TNF as well. So the just um, metabolically creating an inflammatory microenvironment that promotes the tumor growth, as well as specific uh, cytokines and other factors that the, the macrophages secrete in that microenvironment. So it's almost like they're the cancer cells are are making the macrophages zombies to to make their you know secrete what they need to live. The cancer cells need to live. Mm -hmm. So there's these macrophages and they have this ability to to recognize these cancer cells and they are certainly capable of eating the cancer cells. But as we know, cancers are successful because of the fact that they have lots of different mechanisms to evade immune responses. Right. And so one of the major ways that they do this is they put markers on the surface that tell the macrophages phages don't eat me. <laughs> so so there are eat me signals and don't eat me signals. And there so macrophages you mentioned that they they clean things up. They clean up the tissues, they clean up dead cells. So they're like janitors sometimes, <laughs> right? And so how do they recognize those dead cells? Well, so when a cell is dying, um, it's going to leak ATP. And that is considered a find me signal. So just like a chemokine or a chemotactic cytokine. So just like sniffing a gradient to try and find where the source of something is, ATP will leak out of dying cells. Macrophages will follow that ATP signal to find the, the dying cell. Now, when a cell stops metabolizing properly, they don't have enough energy to maintain the a asynchronous outer membrane protein distribution that they have. And so when that happens, there are what's called flippases that keep <laughs> uh, phospholipids um, asymmetrically dispersed on the outer the outer side of the outer membrane and the, the cytoplasmic side of the outer membrane. And when those flippases aren't 
propelled by energy anymore, the the phosphatidyl inositols or phosphatidylserines will flip. And so they're expressed on the cell surface when they not they normally are not. And so this is an eat me signal. So when a cell is dying, they're going to secrete the find me signal and they're going to they're flip these signals up onto the surface so that say the eat me signal. So that's the one way in which macrophages recognize cells to kill. Now, in addition to these eat me signals, there are don't eat me signals. And so cancer cells have, you you know, um, utilize this mechanism to put this molecule called CD47 on the surface. And so if the macrophage engages that CD47, it tells the macrophage, don't eat me. And so obviously one big thing you could do is block that interaction, right? So the CD47 on the cancer cell will bind something called the signal regulatory protein alpha or SERP alpha on the macrophage. And when that engages, the macrophages don't, don't eat the tumor cells. However, monotherapy, like just putting anti-CD47 antibodies in, as we'll learn, they repeated that in this, this model in this paper, doesn't work very well. Right. So just blocking that doesn't allow the macrophages to eat the tumor cells more. So the question then is, what else can you do to drive this response? So what can we do to overcome these signals that the cancer cells are giving to the macrophages so the macrophages can then eat them? Well, this comes is this, to is, is this yeah. CD forty seven uh, tumor specific or nope. So a lot of other cells, other mm -hmm. cells. I th so I didn't look that in great detail, but my suspicion is most healthy cells will express this so that they're not getting eaten mm. um, for for whatever reason they might get targeted. They won't be eaten. Uh, so, I don't know if if viruses use this because that's you know viruses and cancers often use a lot of similar mechanisms to try to evade mu immune responses, mm. and I don't know if viruses upregulate this molecule. Hmm. Do you know that was so with that monotherapy was that specific to pancreatic cancer? I mean, in this example, it seems like it is, but is that because pancreatic cancer is is one of those cancers that has a really high mortality rate? I didn't know if that was one of the reasons why. Maybe there's multiple interactions pre uh, preventing tumor cells to be phagocytized. So I'm I'm looking while you're talking, and it sure. <laughs> I, it, it it looks like that it has has been used to target a variety of different human okay. cancers and malignancies. Um, I'm not sure all of them, but right, it, right. you know, in this paper they use the pancreatic cancer, but I think there are other ones in which they've targeted it, and probably it does work in some situations. Um, in this particular one, it didn't. So right, right. So the, one of the ideas that you could kind of exploit is toll-like receptors to promote the activation of the immune response because the, these are the receptors that are important. We've talked about them before that recognize different microbial patterns to induce the immune responses. And so CPG DNA is one of these. So everybody says, what is CPG DNA? It's just cytosine, guanine, two nucleotides next to each other. There's a phosphate group in between, which is always there. So why they didn't just call them CG instead of CPG, <laughs> but that's the nomenclature. Um, and so they were originally identified um, as, com as a highly overexpressed or yeah, uh, in bacterial DNA. And so if you chop bacterial DNA up, it was stimulatory for cells. And when um, people mapped what was the active fragment in DNA on immune cells like macrophages or just peripheral blood cells, they found that there were a, you had to have a minimum of a six amino acid, uh, six nucleotide, sorry, sequence that had to contain the CG, and the CG could not be methylated. And that's sort of important because in our genomes, the vast majority of our uh, CGs, the C is methylated we have these methylases. And there are, but, you know, this was a caveat that all along was bugging a lot of people when they first characterized this and they said, well, this is bacterial specific. Bacterial have these CG sequences and they activate immune cells and we don't see our own DNA because we don't have these. And the secret was that we do. So those of you who are aware of this, CPG islands are a major mechanism for regulating uh, housekeeping genes to for them to be highly active uh, transcriptionally. So we do have CGs and we do have these six mer motifs, although they're much less frequent. But it turns out that, in fact, over the years, we found that, yes, our own host DNA can trigger these too. That was a side story. But the <laughs> idea here is that you can use stimulation with a CG dinucleotide 
within the context of a specific sequence to trigger a TLR, and that TLR is TLR9. And this TLR stimulation will induce macrophages to take a, on a very M1-like phenotype. So this is a type of macrophage functional profile that's generally anti-tumor. Mm-hmm. So you think, well, maybe you could block CD47 and activate the macrophage at the same time, and maybe that would be enough. So that's part of what they're going to look at in this paper. And then the third thing that we need to talk about is the biochemistry. So I, I delayed as long as possible. So now we're going to go into this. I so, like on, on the notes, it's TLRs. Yay. Biochemistry. Yikes. <laughs> <laughs> I did do that on purpose. I love it. <laughs> um, so, so the metabolic state, as I said, the metabolic state of cells is a really hot topic right now. And cancer cells mm-hmm. specifically. So yeah. cancer cells use a specific glycolytic-like profile. They're not very, um, as I think, they're not very oxidative. And so, uh, I have that backwards. I might have that backwards. So the idea is like if you restrict glucose, so you're not eating a lot of carbs and you're eating more protein, you can starve your cancer. Hmm. So you could potentially, at least partially in diet, modify cancer cell growth. Although it's not, you know, it's not black and white. I'm not telling everybody out there, only eat <laughs> right. protein because you're going to starve a cancer. You'll never get cancer. That's not true. But so, but the idea is like in cells that require a really high metabolic rate and a lot of production of amino acids, lipids, and nucleic acids, they need to have a different type of metabolism than in cells that are just, you know, surviving. Because they need a lot, they need rapid energy sources to produce a lot of ATP. And then they need this shunt to make all these other structural molecules in order to sustain enhanced proliferation. So cancer cells are some of those. And if you can imagine, T cells are another one because T cells can proliferate from one cell to thousands of cells over the course of a few days. Right. It can proliferate faster than 24 in a 24 hour period. So that's another thing. So here's your primer. If you remember anything from your biochemistry, there's oxidative phosphorylation and that produces a lot of ATP using glucose as a source for as, as, acyl-CoA. But it takes a longer, um, but glycolysis will rapidly produce ATP. But the cost is um, you produce a little less, but you can produce it rapidly. But you can also shunt some of the intermediates off to make all these other metabolic things that you need, like nucleic acids, lipids, and amino acids. So when a cell needs an immediate form of energy and rapid proliferation, high metabolic rate, they tend to switch to um, this glycolytic pathway. Um, but they need, still need a source of this acyl-CoA because in um, oxidative phosphorylation, glucose is broken down into pyruvate, and that makes acyl-CoA, and so that's how you get the um, shunting into the TCA cycle. But to get to the TCA cycle the other way without using the, the glucose is the main way to get to pyruvate, you can break down fatty acids. And so it's fatty acid oxidation. And so when you use fatty acid oxidation, you can shunt to this pentose phosphate pathway. You can produce more reactive oxygen, reactive nitrogen. So it's it's metabolically a little bit uh, more destructive that way. But there's, you know, this idea that you can get more energy and, and more metabolic intermediates that you need using this way. Right. This is also a big, Topic, a growing topic in virology because we now understand that, you know, when a virus infects a cell, a lot of things have to be made, yeah. right? Oh, yeah. A lot, of, a lot of parts. So you have to crank up the thermostat. And yep. so we're starting to learn how, you know, viruses manipulate, how they can push metabolic pathways in certain ways. So they get a lot of nucleotides or if they if they have an envelope, they have to make fatty acids and lipids and so forth. And there's some really amazing strategies that are being uncovered. People are getting back into <laughs> metabolism and, and virology. And in fact, last year, I, I, I uh, added a new lecture to my virology course where we talk about metabolic changes uh, in infected cells. It's really, it's really great. Oh, that's cool. It's that's If you paid cool. attention in biochem, now it's paying off. Yes. Yes. Because <laughs> I know that's a very common thread amongst undergraduates or maybe even high school students when they learn about like the Krebs cycle or oxidative phosphorylation. They're like, oh, like when am I going to need to know this? Well, Guess turns what? out <laughs> if you're listening to this podcast, but also, you know, I think that you guys are right. That this is combining 
these type of things uh, with single cell technology. We can learn about what individual cells are doing. And what we'll learn about in this paper is a lot of the subsets of the cells and immunology that we defined, let's say, 30, 40, 50 years ago aren't necessarily holding up over time. And there's a lot more nuance that I think, you know, just looking at surface receptors anymore, we know isn't going to help define these subsets. So looking at things like metabolic profiles, maybe that will help us kind of divide up subsets more and be more fine tuned with our therapies. Hmm. Right. I welcome that. Get away <laughs> from the cell surface. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. Too redundant. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, I, I put a picture in here to to confuse uh, Vincent and Steph. <laughs> nice or picture. Maybe, maybe, maybe you'll know it. It's but a lot yeah, going so, in there. so the end result is that really um, wh- how you use glucose once it gets into the cell and how you're how you're where the acyl co- acetyl-CoA. Sorry, I said acyl acetyl-CoA is coming from, um, and how that's being used in the TCA cycle, and then what the product's coming out the other side. So. If those those individuals who paid attention in class in biochemistry and followed that over time instead of getting off on all these other things that we've studied, they thought, right. well, you know, what if you could measure these things? And um, they came up with the most simple thing, right? So they measure either oxygen consumption or pH change. And that will tell you whether or not you're you're using oxygen to fuel the um, the ATP production complex on the on the mitochondria, or whether you're doing fatty acid oxidation and producing um, acid and lactate out the other side. Right. Right. Mm-hmm. And that's it. That's and there's great. this <laughs> couple hundred thousand dollar machine that does this, <laughs> of course, and everybody's of course. buying them. Right. <laughs> and we're all doing these assays. <laughs> So you have one of these in your lab, you were saying, or I don't have in it your in core, my lab, or, but, but right. we have a core. So, core. so we okay, had what nice. we got one a few years ago, and it's it's actually gotten old now. And so we just got. Isn't that it. crazy that that's two years ago and now I it's know. old? <laughs> yeah, and, and so now we got two brand new machines because this metabolic core is is supposed to be a big deal. So they're putting a lot of money into it at Cornell and actually right. giving us instrumentation. So we have we have a ninety six well and an eight well. And uh, the way this works is you just, you seed the cells in this special, you know, chamber that you have to spend a fortune for so that you can plate them in the thing that goes in the instrument. And um, you just plate the cells in there and then, and then you have to change them to a media with no buffer because you can't buffer your pH change. You ha- th- these are change. These are detecting the minutest little teeny tiny change in pH. So we have to make sure that everything is perfectly set for this. And so you put the cells in in this thing and you have to equilibrate this little sensor plate. And then you put the sensor plate on the cells and you put it in the machine and then it just runs everything. And it it automatically injects in drugs at specific times and then measures the oxygen consumption and the pH change over a few minutes um, following the injection of a drug. And it's this, the, the clever part of it is which drugs do you use and when do you use them? And when you inject things in, for example, you guys can follow along a little bit here. So if you inject in something called oligomycin, what that does is it blocks complex five. And so the oxygen can still be used, but you don't get ATP out the other side. And so you can look at that you can read the basal respiration rate first, and then you add oligomycin and you can look when the itch, the change in the oxygen consumption will tell you um, the, the, the ATP production rate. And then you can treat the cells with something called FCCP, which basically short circuits the entire ATP production complex. And so it produces the, ma- the maximum amount of oxygen consumption rate and acidification because it just the protons are just going back and forth and there's, there's no energy actually produced. And that'll tell you the maximal respiration rate. Hmm. And then you can add two drugs called rotenone and antamycin, and they'll block the early steps in the ATP complex, ATP production complex. And that just j- basically drops all of the oxygen production rate down to background. And so anything left after that is respiration that's not due to the mitochondria 
complex. They're right. oxygen production, ATP production complex. And so you can look at over time after adding these different drugs, you can see the basal rate and then the, the, the rate after ATP production and then the rate after ACCP and then the rate after rotenone. And so then you can look and measure all of these different things, maximal respiration, ATP production, basal respiration, spare capacity, all these things. And they tell you something about how the cell is using its metabolic process. Now, this is just one. This is called the mito stress test, and they have lots of different ones. And so this one is, you know, probing the different parts of the, the um, mitochondrial membrane complex. But then you can also add glucose and modifications of glucose that block glucose uh, metabolism, and you can read things out from there as well. And so this is, this is um, oxygen consumption rate, but then it also measures uh, pH change. So you can also look at the um, what's called ex- and, uh, extracellular acidification rate or ECAR, ECAR. And so you can look at the traces that come from this OCR and ECAR, and that will give you an indication of whether the cells are using fatty acid oxidation or um, oxidative phosphorylation. And so it, it's actually quite a powerful system. And you can there's a lot of different kits you can buy that can probe all the different aspects of cellular metabolism. This is just looking at ATP production, and oxygen usage. Um, but generally, you can they, they're using these kinds of things to say, okay, well, cancer cells use a lot of this one and macrophages mm-hmm. use a lot of this one. But then if you trigger macrophages, they change their metabolic profile and T cells are one profile when they're resting and then another profile when they're um, proliferating. And so all of that together is really interesting. So it's a lot of background, but we had we had eat me and don't eat me signals. We had ways to stimulate cells like CPG DNA and other TLRs. Um, we had a little bit of a primer on the biochemistry and how you use glucose inside of cells and how you measure how a cell is using glucose. So what do they actually do in this paper? So first they tested, they're using a mouse model of pancreatic cancer, as Steph mentioned, um, and it's syngeneic, which means it's from the same, you know, strain of animal. And in this case, they're using mice and immunocompetent. So they are, they're not using, a lot of times when you do a cancer model, you have to use a nude mouse or a, um, a B cell deficient or T cell deficient mouse. I mean, in this case, it's an immunocompetent mouse. And so these tumors grow in the mice. And if they add anti-CD47 as an immunotherapeutic, there was no effect on a tumor. And so, okay, so it could be due to um, the cells not phagocytosing, macrophages not phagocytosing, but it doesn't seem to be the case. Um, the antibodies didn't really do much in vitro either. So they just said, okay, well, well, let's start playing with this. Let's see if we can com- do a combination therapy. Let's add a TLR ligand um, and and the CD47 and see if they could do anything. So if they stimulated with TLRs, um, none of the TLRs enhanced the capacity of macrophages to eat the tumor cells in vitro um, when you add anti-CD47 antibody except CPG DNA. Hmm. Mm -hmm. So so then they put the tumors in, in planted them in a mouse and waited six to 10 days. And that's important because now you have an established tumor. Right, because a lot of immunology papers, when they're looking at cancer papers, they start treatment right when you put the tumor in. So it's basically looking at can you prevent the tumor. It's much more difficult to get something to work if you allow a tumor to get established and then try and treat it, right. which is more biologically relevant to a human. So they allow this tumor to establish, and then they add the CPG DNA, and lo and behold, the CPG DNA reduced the tumor volume. Um, they showed nearly flat growth curves for a while. They enhanced survival, but eventually there was relapse. But but CBG showed promise, right? Right. So how did it do it? How, so how, why, why is CPG DNA doing this? So it seems to reduce tumor growth. Um, and so it increased inflammatory cytokines. They could measure this in the sera of the mice. Um, and there was an increase in the number of tumor-associated macrophages, which would suggest that they're getting there. And there's an increase in the macrophages that have tumor cells inside of them when they look in the tumors. So somehow when you treat the mice, and they were very specific about saying they were treating these mice IV and not IM or, or, or sub-Q. A lot of, lot of people do that. Um, and so they think that this had some better mechanism of working. I don't know really how that would work. It could maximize like the delivery because it could probably reach the tumor better. 
I would yeah. Assume. So uh, yeah, I think that the you know the vascularized tumor also is going to you know the CPG is going to get into the tumor and it could act on those local macrophages. Probably right. part of part of what it's doing. Right. So so they see these. So the CPG has an effect. They see the macrophages increase. They see the macrophages eat more tumor cells, but. You know, what you just asked was, you know, where where is this being delivered? So where is the CPG actually acting? So they asked, is it actually the tumors associated macrophages or could it be all the other macrophages in the body that are uh-huh. doing something? So they used a drug called GW2580. It's an inhibitor um, of CSF1 receptor. And so that would prevent any new macrophages from getting into the tumor. And so when they did that, it didn't have any effect. So they think that the, the macrophages that are already in the tumor, once the tumor establishes, the ones that are really critical for when you add CPG, they're having this effect. Well, that would make sense based, Cindy, on what you said in the past, that when you have these tumor-associated macrophages surrounding the tumor, they're almost like in a trance. And so they are yes. specifically being affected by not the peripheral macrophages. So that does make sense. That's right. Mm-hmm. And all these macs have TLR9, is that right? In mouse, they do well, and it's interesting because they don't, they don't, um, they don't really ever look at TLR nine. When you do a search of the word TLR nine, it's only in this paper three times, two in uh, <laughs> references, and one to describe CPG. So I think that's something that I we will talk about later. But yeah, they don't pay any attention to TLR nine in this paper. Like yeah, no, not no TLR knockout mice, no TLR no. knockout macrophages, unless I missed it in the supplement. No, okay, no. <laughs> <laughs> but that's maybe uh, for later. We can work our way through the paper. Yeah. <laughs> so there's there's two things there. We can we can address it now. Might as well. Sure, sure. Uh, you know, um, one is that I I had written something when I was going to talk the intro, and I I jumped over it, and that is there are other DNA sensors, right? Right. And uh, Vincent, you know this really well. So there are cytosolic sensors for. DNA that see DNA viruses, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, sting, see gas, sting. and things. Yep. But you know, it's less likely that if you inject mm-hmm. CPG into a mouse, that it's going to make it to a macrophage, and that macrophage is going to take up that CPG and then somehow shuttle it into the cytosol. Mm-hmm. So it's probably more likely to be TLR9 dependent, although they did they did never test that, so they can't yeah, see that for I sure. I don't know. It seems to me, I mean, if you don't want to pay the money for the TLR9 knockout mice, just get a cell line and just try. I don't know. That probably yeah. opened up a can of worms. I'm assuming maybe they did try, and there are probably different mechanisms. I don't know. There it just seems be. suspicious that it was missing. Yeah. And the, the other thing that we have to put out there that I was going to yeah. save for the very end, but the, <laughs> uh, that I kind of like when I answered your question the first time, I sounded a little funny. And that's because human macrophages don't express TLR9. Bum, bum, so this bum. is a beautiful study, but how relevant is that going to be for humans? I don't know. So if CPG is the only one that works out of the TLRs they tested and there's no TLR9 to see CPG in a human, I don't think this mechanism is going to work. Does it negate the whole study? Absolutely not. I think that the bigger idea here is that this the, the modulating the me- metabolism of a macrophage to um, thwart the negative impact of a cancer cell on the macrophage's ability to kill it is the important part. Definitely. Important, important definitely. Thing. And the okay. fact that we don't know if it's TLR9 still leaves the potential for an That's intracellular true. signaling um, sensor like, you know, sting or sea gas. So I think definitely still relevant in terms of metabolic states of cells. Um, but yeah, that is interesting. So in, hu- in humans then, uh, TLR9, it's on B cells and at DCs or Pla- special, it's not just any DC. It's a one unique special kind of DC called a plasma cytoid. Okay, dendritic yeah. cell. Yeah, gotcha. Yep. So it might be very low expression on a few other cells. Somebody probably is working on that, and listening to this, and saying, "My cell expresses it." <laughs> but but um, the two major expressors are of our B cells and plasma cytoid dendritic cells, right? So, uh, so where were we? So we said this, they've narrowed it down to the macrophages that are actually in the tumors that are responsible um, for mediating this CPG induced protection. Um, And then they also um, looked at PD-1, which we've talked about 
in um, immune 14 for immunotherapies, and it didn't seem to have any effect on that because CPG is known um, to induce, I guess in some cells it can induce expression of PD-1, but it was not changing the expression of PD-1 inducing or reducing expression of PD-1 or PD-L1 in the cancer cell or the macrophage in the tumor. So it wasn't that. And they also went one step further and used what are called RAG2 deficient mice just to show that it's not T cells and B cells. If this really is an innate cell. All of these data together said that this really was macrophage. We have this CPG treatment via macrophages is protecting the cells and the, uh, the, the, I'm sorry, it is allowing the macrophages to kill the cancer cells. And so they uh, looked at bypassing CD47 um, signal in- introduced by the tumor cell. So they t- tested a bunch of different tumors that both had and didn't have CD47. And what they discovered was this CPG-induced protective effect was totally independent of CD47 expression. So that might explain some of the um, initial observations where if they just treated with anti-CD47 antibody as an immunotherapy, it wasn't Mm -hmm. working in this model. Because when you add the CPG, it just doesn't, it doesn't matter. This is all CD47 independent. So don't eat me doesn't matter. I don't know how we fit that in there. So if it's <laughs> so if it's not if it's not dependent on these eat me or don't eat me signals, but CPG is enhancing the ability of cancer cells to be eaten by macrophages, what exactly is going on? So I don't know if they tested a whole bunch of other things or they just said we have a seahorse analyzer and we'll <laughs> do some studies. But um, bottom line was they started looking at macrophage metabolism. And they argue, you know, oh, there's a lot of people looking at macrophage metabolism and M1, M2 have different metabolic profiles. And so this might be important, which is all true. But the bottom line is, so they stimulated cells with CPG DNA. And if you stimulate cells typically with a TLR ligand, we think of that as a very strong M1 inducer. And everybody said for a long time, you know, oh, M1, M2, this dichotomy, this strict uh, either or designation is is kind of not really uh, realistic because right. there's a spectrum of macrophage phenotypes, as you mentioned, stuff. Right. Um, and so when they stimulated with CPG, they were a little bit more careful than some other people to look at exactly what were those macrophages making. And it turns out that they made some things that were made by M1 cells and some things that were made by M2 cells. Uh, and so they didn't really look like M1 or M2 And some of the markers that you would typically associate with one or the other, they didn't change expression at all. So they had this really weird in-between phenotype. And uh, so then they said, okay, well, if you stimulate cells with LPS and interferon gamma and they become very strongly M1 and this causes them to increase their oxidative phosphorylation or whatever, and you stimulate them with M2, they go the other way, or I think it's vice versa, sorry, Um, well, it's confusing. Um, but but so what is CPG doing? Because we always thought of that as an M1 marker, you know, right. an M1 stimulus. And so what they saw was that um, all the TLR ligands increased this glycolytic flux or this ECAR, so the pH increase. And they use this, you know, seahorse to measure this and, and everything. Um, but the interesting thing was, and the sort of unexpected thing was that CPG, but not the other TLRs, also increased the basal oxidative respiration, the spare and spare respiratory, reduced the spare respiratory capacity. So it's doing both. <laughs> it's changing the <laughs> metabolic activity both directions where we typically think it goes either this way or that way. Mm-hmm. It's doing both. So it again now has this unusual kind of intermediate phenotype. So it's sort of in between an M1, M2 and it's in between glycolysis and um, oxidative phosphorylation. <laughs> Can we call it M1.5? <laughs> I don't know. That sounds good to me. <laughs> or M... Um, X, I don't know. <laughs> uh, I think there's already one of those, but yeah. So, so it's this in between thing, and they've got markers of both, and so that's interesting. And since CPG was the only one that had this enhancing effect on using anti CD forty seven antibody in this pancreatic cancer model, does this actually have anything to do with anything? And so they hypothesized that maybe this unique metabolic pathway activation was important for the anti tumor activity. 
And so they start probing this by looking. They first see if there's more mitochondria inside the cells that are stimulated with CPG, which I was going to do. I've been looking forward to doing this experiment. They already did it. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> but that's okay. Because, you know, I mean, this is these beautiful dyes that you can add that will stain the mitochondria and you can image them in live cells and you can look at them fizz and fuse. Oh, and you can cool. count them and you can see how big they are and everything. And so I was all excited to do this. But they've done it. Anyway, so the bottom line is that they have more mitochondria, which fits with an increased oxidative um, phosphorylation rate, OCR increase, right? Right. And then they started probing fatty acid oxidation. So it's the other way. So they treat with a drug called edamoxer. Do you guys know how to say that? I think you you said it. I think, yeah, that's as good as I would have said it. All right. (laughs) So it inhibits a protein called carnitine palmitle transferase 1A. Anyway, um, when they did that, they blocked the ability of the CPG to change the OCR rate. And they also reduce the ability of CPG to enhance phagocytosis of tumor cells in vitro. So hmm. I thought, hmm, that's kind of cool. The fatty acid oxidation pathway seems to be connected to the phagocytosis of tumor cells. So what would you do next? You would give exogenous fatty acids to see what happens. I guess you could do that. They did something different. Hmm. They gave the atoxamere in vivo. And see if it affected the tumor. And it did. So if they blocked with atoxamere, they blocked the ability of the CPG to protect against the tumor. Hmm. Even though there were the same number of macrophages in the tumor. So the CPG somehow, its ability to change the metabolic respiration of the macrophages affects its ability to phagocytose the tumor cells even in vivo. So all together, this shows that this fatty acid oxidation induced by CPG is critical for the anti-tumor effects by increasing phagocytosis of tumor cells, and that all of this is independent of this eat me signal via CD forty-seven. Mm-hmm. So. I, there was something I was curious about in this section before you had gotten to the um, uh, looking at fatty acid oxidation. They did say that the CPG. Uh, they did upregulate PDL1 on mm. the macrophages. And so while we usually think of PDL1 on the tumors, do yes. we know much about macrophage T cell interactions? That if you're upregulating PDL1 question. on macrophages? Mm. If you upregulate PDL1 on macrophages, I would think you would be suppressing some T cell responses. Yeah, that's what I was thinking that maybe the unintended, I mean, we'll, we'll see they did take out the T cells and nothing changed. So I guess that right. tells you that it's exactly. fine. Exactly. But it's interesting that it was upregulated, which we think of as another inhibitory signal. So maybe some potential for, I mean, it seems to be fine, but I thought that was kind of interesting that the tumor didn't change, but the ma- but the macrophage did. That's true. I forgot about that point. Yeah. yeah. I mean, and, this is and, data not shown. That's why. I, so I don't, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> maybe that was on purpose. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. I tend to ignore that when they see data not shown until I see it. <laughs> <laughs> right. Exactly. <laughs> so it might be really a small amount of change, but um, yeah. So I, it could, it, it, the, you know, in general, macrophages in tumors are, immunosuppressive, right? So maybe it's affecting some aspects of the, uh, you know, the suppressive activity of macrophages, not other, ac- other, not other aspects. Right, right. That's true. So when you, when you do fatty acid oxidation, what, what product of that is, is important for the CPG effect? Is it just, just getting energy? Because that's a way to get energy, right? It is a way to get fatty. energy. Um, I, the, you know, that's the part they leave out. And I, mm-hmm. I, I don't know if you guys read the discussion. I read it and I didn't see it was, where they address that at all. Yeah, no, they don't really. Um, I mean, fatty acid oxidation will give you more acetyl-CoA. So, mm-hmm. I mean, yes. that yeah. can help the TCA cycle. Well, they, they, yes. they suggested that might go to cholesterol biosynthesis, which and the you fluidity need for of the membrane. Right, yeah. right, because they yeah, that very last true. experiment. Mm-hmm. That's right. I forgot about yeah, that. They did the Brefeldin experiment. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. yeah. Tell, tell so, us about that. Yeah, they blocked the ability. <clears throat> excuse me. Of oh, what can I don't I can't remember which chemical Brefeldin they used. A. Yeah, but thank you, Brefeldin A. So that and, blocks uh, secretion from the ER. Right. Right. Yes. And so when you treat 
cells with Rafeldin A, it inhibits the CPG effect, basically. Yes, yep, yep. Because they don't phagocytose as well because you need membrane fluidity for that. So maybe, that, yeah. you know, maybe the fatty acid oxidation and, and getting cholesterol is, is related to that as well. Mm -hmm. Right. That's true. Although we have also looked at intracellular trafficking of TLR9 and when mm. we treated with Brafeldin A, TLR9 didn't didn't traffic to the right compartment in order to be able mm. to see CPG DNA. Mm. So it huh. also so, may yeah. be a ligand access issue. So it yeah. may be sure. true, true, and not for the right reason. But um, yeah, it's true. Yep. Yeah. So that's why I think that's why I got confused because I I blocked that out because I was like I don't know if I believe that. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, um, yeah. So. Regardless of whether it's membrane fluidity or intracellular trafficking, clearly if you block that pathway, it's it's interfering with the ability of the CPG to have its effect. That's a great point. I think they they kind of think it's fluidity, but you're right. It couldn't just be uh, getting the the TLR to the right place. Yeah, right. Make, right makes yeah. sense. Yep. 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 So uh, the last thing they did in this paper is they really went into a deeper dive into where the fatty acid that you use to um, increase the fatty acid oxidation, you know, where you're getting that acetyl-CoA from following CPG stimulation. And they showed it was this lipogenesis um, and not free fatty acid uptake. So there are two ways to get more fatty acids to metabolize to get acetyl-CoA for the fatty, uh, fatty acid oxidation pathway. So you can take them up from outside of the cell or you can make them or degrade lipids that you already have and chew them up for, to, to make it. And so it's not taking it up from outside. It's, it's intracellular sources, which is interesting because um, if I understood what they were saying correctly, the uptake from extracellular sources is a typical way that macrophages get as, uh, you know, uh, lipids to support fatty acid oxidation. So one of the things we've done is looked at um, different uptake of different fatty acids by cells. And when you differentiate them or treat them in different ways, they definitely have a different capacity to take up lipid. Uh, and so M2s take up a lot more lipid than M1 cells. Mm -hmm. um, and, and we tend to call them not M2 cells, we call them foam cells, which is a different name, but it's related to atherosclerosis. So macrophages can have different phenotypes in atherosclerotic plaques as well when they take up a lot of exogenous extracellular lipid, and they can use it for this metabolic pathway as well. But it seems like in this case, for whatever CPG is doing, it's ramping up the met metabolic pathway to use the intracellular stores of lipid to shunt into this fatty acid oxidation to generate energy. Hmm. So that might argue against a ketogenic diet, correct? Because if you're having, it wouldn't really matter yes. if you're adding fatty no, acids. No, <laughs> it wouldn't matter. So uh -huh. you can starve yourself and do that. But at least for your macrophages, it might not make a difference. Right, I right. believe, and I can be corrected, but I believe for cancer, it's the other way. They do right. take up lipids from outside. Um, and then that that shunts into this pathway and provides energy for the cancer cells. Right. Yeah. So, so they note in the discussion that in people, CPG has had limited efficacy, right? And yeah. they argue that it's because it wasn't given systemically like they did in this experiment. I don't believe that. But yeah. But you, you would say because there's said. no TLR9 in people. Right? Yes, that's right. <laughs> right. <laughs> but is there I, another TLR that would recognize CPG? Uh, no. Nine. There's not another one that would recognize CPG, but seven and nine are very similar. Mm -hmm. um, they, they, they both strongly induce type one interferons. Um, I don't know, but could test whether they induce the same metabolic pathways. Now I, I have to go back and look, did they test seven? I think they tested two, four, three. Yeah, they did. They and did nine, test. they did test seven and it didn't see. show up. Right. Um, yeah, here it is. They they tested yeah imiquimod, but they wrote it l miquimod. They t they typed it wrong. So two, three, four, five, and seven. Yeah. So yeah, imiquimod. That's only one of many ligands for TLR seven that, in theory, should all work the same way. But I don't know if they do all work the same way. So seven is potentially still a viable alternative. But there are other there are other ones that are much less well studied, um, eleven, twelve, and so forth. So right, right. the the jury's still out. So what what's next with this, Cindy? 
So, so what do you do? <laughs> well, <laughs> you know, um, this was really a complicated paper. And once I started reading it, I was like, what did I get into? But um, I think, you know, the idea that, you know, metabolic status of cancer cells and immune cells is, 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 is really important. And we don't really fully understand what's going on, but some, you know, a probing or inhibiting different parts of these metabolic states um, could alter macrophages within a tumor. And, and at the same time, you could have similar or opposite effects on cancer cells that if, you, if you're altering the metabolism of both of these, maybe, just maybe, it could have um, some therapeutic benefit. Would it ever work on its own? Probably not as a monotherapy. But if you can you know, slow down cancer growth and ramp up the immune cells, maybe that's sort of how we work. Should that also be combined with something like PD-1 and other checkpoint inhibitors? Mm -hmm. Maybe. Maybe this is combining it with CD47, but maybe you get a different outcome if you combine it with a, P a PD1 blockade. When we said we said CPG was inducing PDL1 on macrophages. Maybe if you block that interaction on T cells, maybe if you can have the T cells active and the macrophages active, you even have something better. Right. Or maybe it's not the CPG focus, but just the fact that they discovered this intermediate macrophage phenotype that, you know, seems to, um, when it's stimulated, kill tumor cells. So is there another stimulant that can upregulate? Yeah. I mean, maybe that's the way to go since we, you know, TLR9 isn't on them in humans. I think yeah. that's exactly right. You could find it. You could find a drug that may have a similar effect on the metabolism, maybe yep. right now that now that you sort of know what to look for. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Seems to but it sense. would have, remember, if these things are not going to be specific to, right? So right. Right, right. they are mm -hmm. going to affect metabolism in every cell. And what effect that's going to have, I don't know. Yeah, like giving, inter they said they hadn't done intravenous. Is that what you had said before? So, I mean, giving an intravenous CPG, <laughs> you know, what's that going to do to your B cells and dendritic cells? Um, I imagine there's going to be side effects. Yeah, there's going to be cytokine storm and things right. with it too. Right. They all have their caveats, right? <laughs> right, right. But it is but, a very cool paper. I'm glad we went through it. I learned a little bit more about Seahorse. What You know, yeah. I had heard of it, but don't work with it. So that was nice. Yeah, that was great. I really enjoyed that. Yeah, it, it, yeah. It's, uh, it's quite a, a lot of work, but and it was really it, a lot of work. Uh, I think it's presented pretty clearly that you can really get the major points out of it. It's good. Yeah, definitely. And I, I, I didn't go through each figure. I mean, we could have done that, yeah, but I, th no, I think generally fine. the <laughs> points that we discussed were the major yeah, points. Totally. Because they did a lot of work in this paper. Right. Yep, right. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. Let's see now. We have... Uh, we, didn't we, we give away time. a book? Yeah. Yeah. So last ooh, that we're giving away that? a book. Um, and I forgot what, what the book is. Something with monocytes. It's monocytes. People seem very excited about monocytes. And Cindy would say, of course, why Why not? Of Something about myeloid cells. Yeah. Oh, myeloid Any, cells. Anyway, so a lot of people wrote in. Let's see if we can. I was so glad to see so many responses. You know, you never know. I mean, you know, you have the numbers, but we don't know how many people listen. So it's nice to see. Yeah. I mean, for the other podcasts, we get pretty good responses when we giveaway book. So this is the first one So for immune. And so it was a great response. So let's see, we have uh, Dahlia wrote in, Chris wrote in, Chris is a PhD student at Indiana University, where we went last year to uh, do a twim. And he, he, uh, he, I've been listening to Twix, and that is probably what pushed me to go to graduate school. Oh my gosh, oh, that's great. That's I so studied cool. mass spec under the, the direction of David Klemmer and share these podcasts with him. He shares my admiration for this sort of scientific media. Thanks for creating a dialogue and explaining the fascinating world of immunology. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> so Amanda is a grad student in Saskatchewan. Yeah. And would like the book. I've always been intrigued by the immune system. Immune was my first immune podcast. Still going through the backlog of episodes. Keep up the good work. Uh, Anthony, this is a good one. I found the subject of immunology to be an uphill battle. Jeepers, I thought. The only thing I know so far is that B stands for bone and T for thymus. And now oh. I find out that I even had that half wrong. That's really funny. I know. I love it. Mitch uh, is also a longtime listener. Uh, Sam is a PhD student at NIH and Cambridge University working on myeloid cells. Uh, Trudy. Um, 
is a listener to all the other podcasts and someone who writes in a lot. And she wrote, I need this book. <laughs> <laughs> I would be remiss if I didn't take this opportunity to thank all of you for your continued efforts. Aww. I'm a patent agent, and the material discussed here is often so relevant to my work that I've listened to several of the episodes multiple times, in particular episodes 4, 7, and 14 about CAR T-cells, the complement system, and checkpoint inhibitor. Therapy. Oh, that's great. I'm glad we can be of use. <laughs> <laughs> Aditya. Right. This, so is, immuno, this is a really is that Immunophobes. <laughs> <laughs> he's, a, he's an Australian high school student. Yeah, wow. this one was nice. Uh, I don't have knowledge of immunology, though I enjoy keeping a sense of smug pretension listening <laughs> to your conversations as if I'm one of those readers who send in corrections, but I'm not. <laughs> Instead, your thoughts and ideas travel to the periphery of my cerebral horizons at this best Western place. <laughs> and it's a very funny It's very, email. it's very unique and, and uh, creative. And after he wrote it, he said, or she, I don't know. I totally regret. <laughs> I totally regret writing that email. <laughs> you, I said. They said I thought I was being creative, and they were creative, and it was wonderful. It was, it was very it nice. Was, don't yeah, regret yeah. it. Entertaining. We love these. It's a very good. Uh, Steph, why don't you take a couple and? Yeah, sure. Hi, immunesters. It's minus three here at Theo College in Northwest PA. Tons of snow. Um, as an immunoparasitologist myself, I'm biased to TWIP and immune. I make TWIP part of my parasitology course, and we'll start making immune part of my course, my immunology course next time I teach it. And third, I'd love the book. Hey, I want to know, is this Delbert that I know? Because I, how many Delberts are there? That's true. Yeah. <laughs> he, was a, he was a grad student here, and I wanted to oh. know if that was him. Oh, anyway. right in, Delbert. Yeah, let, let me know. know. Uh, Kevin, I just found this show after listening to the Twim Twiv Twivo. It's been great learning about immunology through the show. Uh, Cindy, you can take the next one. <laughs> Short and sweet. Candace, but. Candace writes, did I win? So Candace is down the hall. <laughs> so so she's also, I'm going to give her a shout out. She's probably going to be very embarrassed and turn red if she hears this, but um, <laughs> she's starting her own podcast and I'm sort of her little mentor for her podcast. Oh, that's great. And it's called Excelsior and, and it's fantastic. And she's great doing name. an awesome job. And I hope I got it right. And um, and so she's talked to me a lot about immunology. She's incredibly passionate. She's passionate about uh, science communication. And yeah, she's doing this podcast. So oh, that's great. Good, can, you know, good luck with it. Yeah. Um, Amy writes, want to thank you for your efforts, science communication, like to enter for the drawing. Immunity runs in my family, so I'm very interested in all things immune. Uh, they've She's been listening to the micro podcast and motivate me to book, go back to graduate school. I did an undergrad Yay. in microbiology. That's great. Um, Sue Ellen, I hope I get the book. Episode 16 was great, but all the immune episodes are great. Um, let's see. Eric, I'd love to be entered to win a chance. Michael, this is one of my favorite Twix podcasts. There's a couple more. Cindy, you can you can do some. Sure. Things. Um, well, you gave me the long ones. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> no, no. So so Matt writes, hi, immunonauts. I always love these you you guys come up with the most creative names. Is this something that's like for all of the the podcast yeah, that you do, it Vincent. Is, yeah. I just, I love it. I love reading these. So you know, cute. I'm going to put a little note to myself. I'm going to go through all 17 episodes. I'm going to read all the names. Ooh. I'm going to compile them in a separate sheet and then we can have a list. Cause what a I, great idea. Yeah, I'll do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So anyway, so Matt writes, I would like to throw my hat in the ring for the contest if it isn't over already. I guess because we only come out once a month, they think it might be <laughs> over. But um, so Matt's a technician in the HIV lab, and right. it would be past time to learn about macrophages and their kin, and this book would be great help. Um, and he also thanks us for the podcast and for this week's podcast in general. They've been a big help as I have moved from more general microbiology to virology, and you can't really learn about viruses without learning about the immune system as well. Agreed. Agreed. <laughs> Agreed. Um, so Sophia writes, uh, hello, immunodecipherers. And greetings from Greece. Greece, we're worldwide. Yay. Yay. <laughs> That's great. Uh, I love this. It says, first, I'd like to say that the female hosts in the show have such beautiful and warm voices and make it so exciting to learn about immunology. Thank Aww, you. Oh, thanks, Sophia. That's nice. Honestly, I've always avoided immunology because it's so complicated and I never get what happens in the end, but you guys have made me feel better about this subject and you have so much excitement talking about it that I get hooked. So down to business. Congratulations to Steph. Uh, woo. She graduated not that long ago and moved. <laughs> 
And I love this. This is so cute. Also, if I win this book, very small chance, I would like to donate it to Cindy since she wanted to read it. And then after she reads it, she can tell us all about it and I will understand more this way. <laughs> oh, that's so cool. <laughs> oh, and uh, so I, I, I'll just read the end of this. Finally, another listener was looking for books for lay people that explain immunology. Yeah, we talked about that in one of our, our um, one of the ones we did. Okay, so there is quite an old book out there which might be considered outdated or classic, depends on how you see it, but I love the author and would like to recommend it. It is called The Thorn in the Starfish by Robert Desowitz. So, um, I wish a great year of podcast. Please keep it simple. (laughs) (laughs) If you wouldn't mind. I wouldn't mind if you didn't do any papers and just talk about a subject and ask each other questions as you do. Just a suggestion. Hmm. Thanks again for doing this. Uh, And she is six degrees in Greece. And so that's the end of our entries. So if you didn't write in, you should have because you had a decent chance. So we had 17, I think. 17, not bad. So let let me pick a random number between one and 17. And the number is number eight. Eight. And I didn't not label them. Let's <laughs> Uh-oh. see. Uh-oh. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight is uh, the high school student in oh. Australia. Oh, so that's great. That might take a little longer to get there. It sure will. <laughs> so, Aditya, you have to send me your address. Yay. You have to um, email it to immune at microbe.tv. And you need, I, I need a phone number because international shipping requires that. So oh, even great. though you wrote a corny email, <laughs> you won, but that's yeah. a random thing. Anyway, we'll have more books to give away in the future. Keep listening yeah. so that you'll hear. You have to listen, otherwise you'll never know. Right. Right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let's end up with some picks of the week. Steph, sure. do you have a pick? I do, I do. So I have uh, pasted in here. It's called The Pregnant Scholar. Mm. And what this is, is an organization um, that basically tries to improve the uh, knowledge about women who are pregnant or nursing or parents, but mostly focus on women in STEM, about their rights, particularly their Title IX rights, and really trying to educate broadly administration down to the student level. Um, And it was originally funded by the National Science Foundation, so it was a part of NSF. But there's a team of three, uh, two professors and a lawyer who's the staff attorney. Uh, And with the pregnant scholar, I am working with the person who runs, who's the attorney, and she's kind of like the liaison for on the ground. She's really involved. And with her, we've started this community um, ambassador program where you can become an ambassador through the pregnant scholar to kind of be a point person at your campus. For somebody who might be experiencing discrimination, if they are pregnant or were pregnant or are nursing, there's a lot of things within the umbrella of motherhood in academia. And this spans from undergraduate, graduate, postdoc. So this is really um, all encompassing. And so we're really trying to make this something where there's a point person on every campus if they have, if there's issues, because a lot of this is just education and understanding what your rights are and where to go. And so I just want to um, put that as my pick. And if you know anyone who needs information or support to get a hold of me and I'd be happy to help. That's great. Can you put the link in there? Yes. That's great. Yes. Cindy, what do you have? So um, I was looking around to see which, which of these many, many, many articles I could choose, but I chose one article. um, uh, Basically there's an increase of over 500% for immunization against measles in this county in Washington state where they're having an outbreak of measles. And so it's really the measles outbreak is getting so bad that the anti-vaxxers are vaccinating. I made that, I made that title. I should have read an opinion article on you that. Should. titled that because I think that's great. But I, but I think what it calls to, to light though, is that, you know, it's easy to say that we don't want to vaccinate, um, you know, when, when things are great, 
But then when things are not so great and we're having outbreaks, people are realizing how important this is. And so there's an increased demand. And it's it's sad news, but great news that these these people are getting immunized. And and I debated between this too, you know, there are, are because these outbreaks and these students are hearing about this, there are kids that are trying teenagers, I would say, that are trying to find out ways to get immunized without their parent consent. Because if they're under 18 or whatever, and they're still considered a child, they need parent consent. And the parents are not immunizing them because it's against their beliefs. And the children are begging for the vaccines. So it's, it's an interesting state in which we are in right now, as far as the the landscape of disease outbreaks, and things that can be completely prevented by vaccines and people's attitudes towards vaccines and perhaps how they're changing and that might be good. Yeah, yeah. It's just amazing that the anti-vaxxers started this outbreak. <sighs> yep. And now they're getting vaccinated, which is great, but, you know, you could have prevented the whole thing yep. right. by just vaccinating. There's yep. nothing wrong with vaccinating. It is so bad. It's just amazing. Yep. Uh, my pick is a website, uh, a nonprofit organization called the S Center for Science in the Public Interest. And this was founded in 1971. It's a science-based consumer advocacy organization, which is focused on improving the food system to support healthy eating. Huh. So they pro provide advice, which is science-based. I love and, this idea. Um, Great. I, I came across this today in a, New York huh. Times article, they mentioned it about uh, food. So it's really good. They have a great agenda. They're nonprofit. They do a lot of important things. They have articles like, yeah. you know, what you should de eat, what you shouldn't eat, coconut oil, probably um, ketogenic diet you can find here as well. <laughs> so Center for Science in the Public Interest. Yeah, and they have a tab there, Eating Healthy, and it, it's it's science-based information about ingredients, foodborne illnesses, uh, foods to avoid, what to eat. I'm going to read this yeah, for sure. Yeah, definitely. And within the, because a lot of times with, I always go straight to the biotechnology section to see mm -hmm. what their views are on GMOs. And yep. what I really like about this is they just address head on, hey, here is the science. Here's why they are different, um, but here's why they are safe. And I, I like that they're kind of upfront with that, but yet they state, you know, this is our position. Yeah. They're safe. Yeah. Yeah. Great. All right, Thanks. that's immune number 17. You can find it at microbe.tv slash immune or on any podcast player that you use to listen to podcasts. Please subscribe so you get every episode and we know how many people are listening. That really helps us a lot. Send your questions and comments to immune at microbe.tv and keep listening. We'll have another book contest soon. Uh, and and uh, if you really like what we do, consider supporting us financially over at microbe.tv slash contribute. Immune is Cindy Leifer from Cornell University. You can find her on Twitter at Cindy Leifer. Thanks, Cindy. Thank you. See you next month. Steph Langle is at Duke University on Twitter. Stephanie Langle. Thanks, Steph. Yeah, thank you. This is great. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. Music on Immune is by Steve Neal. SteveNealPercussion.com. Thanks for listening to Immune, the podcast. That's infectious. We'll be back next month. <laughs>